Guys, I want to thank the following sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, the gear shop. also want to let you know right now they're having a Black Friday sale. Uh, it's, they're also giving away an elk hunt. All you got to do is spend. For every $200 you spend, you get an entry. Uh, this is a great limited entry, Utah elk hunt. Um, and $200 gets you an entry. I believe they're going to announce the winners on January 8th. Uh, you can go to GoHunt.com. Uh, for all of the information and all of the details to win this hunt. Also, a lot of great items, uh, big sale, Black Friday sale. Uh, it's, it's open right now, uh, so go check it out. I want to thank Cody Nelson, my friend of 20-plus years. He's the optics manager over there. If you guys have any um, optics needs at all, if you're looking to buy binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, range finders, tripods, if you want to talk glassing, glassing technique, strategies, give Cody a call, 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can also go and send him an email directly. It's optics at gohunt.com. I want to thank GoHunt for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's K-U-I-U.com. That's their website. It's a direct-to-consumer uh, brand. Uh, it's the best ultralight hunting gear on the market. It's what I wear. I've been wearing it since 2010. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal gear. Uh, just love the stuff. They continue to keep coming out with just great stuff and pushing that bar of, of innovation. Uh, go to kuyu.com, K-U-I-U.com uh, to order right directly on the website. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott19 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount. And OnXMaps.com. Onyx Maps uh, app on your phone is the best Western hunting tool someone could have. It's got an aerial map, topo map, uh, a hybrid mode just by switching, just by hitting a button. Uh, you can measure. It's got a line distance tool. You can measure uh, between points from, you know, measure distances. It's got a breadcrumb feature. Uh, it's just it replaces a GPS. It's an awesome tool. Go to onyxmaps.com uh, right now. Uh, they're doing a Thanksgiving special, 30% off. Just enter thanks 30. Uh, when they send you an email, if you would just tell them that J Scott sent uh, sent you guys uh, to them. I appreciate that. Uh, so a 30%. Normally it's a 20% for the J Scott 19 promo code, but they've got a uh, thanks 30 going on right now so you can actually get it for 30 percent off uh, awesome tool guys I want to thank you for supporting this podcast you can send me messages on my Instagram uh, at J Scott outdoors you can also send me an email uh, J Scott outdoors at gmail.com thanks for listening guys Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, guys. I've got a great episode for us. I've got Justin Earhart of Premium Hunts out of Springerville, Arizona on the line. Justin, how you doing? Good. How you doing, Jay? Good. Uh, well, um, last time we talked, I think it was prior to the uh, archery elk season and kind of the rut, and... Today I want to talk about late elk hunts, but before we get into late elk hunts, uh, talk a little bit of a recap of how the season went for you guys in Arizona and New Mexico for elk. You know, it's been a pretty pretty solid season this year. Um, the rut was pretty slow off and on, but um, man, we, we've really had a great year. Horn growth's been pretty solid all the way around from unit to unit that we've been in, so been pretty fortunate so with the rut being slow the antler growth was great though wasn't it yeah the antler growth was great i mean even in the more arid units it it was really good would you say comparing antler growth to, from arizona to to Me to new mexico was it uh, pretty much the same across the board or did one state shine over the other you know, it was pretty solid across the board. Um, even even in some of the drier units in New Mexico, it was pretty solid. Um, there were a couple that, you know, we didn't see exceptional horn growth on, but still, I mean, anything after last year was a 
breath of fresh air for sure. Everything yeah. on the up and up. You guys um, had archery hunters in one in 27 this year for Arizona or just one of the units? No, we had them in both. How did the units compare to each other this year? They were, you know, about the same. I mean, the red action was kind of off and on for us in both units and you know we were on some really really great bulls in in both units coming off a year like last year where the antler growth was just pitiful it's amazing to see what good winter moisture will do for those elk it's such a such a contrast isn't it yeah it's it was pretty amazing i mean you know one in 27 they're not as susceptible to the drought as a lot of other units but I mean, it, it still seemed like there was a little bit of a jump this year um, compared to last year, you know. So it was good to see that. As far as size goes, um, what were some of the bigger bulls that you guys were able to harvest on, on the season? Oh, the, uh, the biggest bull that we took um, so far has been a mid-380s bull. Okay. And we were pretty happy to get the deal done with him with the bull we've been chasing for multiple years and finally finally got to put our hands on him was he bigger smaller how did he compare to the last couple of years he he was a lot better this year than he was last year for sure uh an old bull or what do you what do you think yeah he was he was a really old bull i mean his ivories were paper paper thin it's uh probably some of the most worn out teeth I've seen on a bull in a long time. So switching over to New Mexico, were your um, New Mexico hunts, are they all over with or do you still have some late hunts in New Mexico? No, all the elk hunts are pretty much over with. Um, we're, you know, wrapping up with a few things like deer and some Barbary sheep and stuff like that. But for the most part, all the elk hunts are done for us. And in New Mexico, what units do you primarily guide in? Uh, we try to concentrate in and all around the Gila, so anywhere from about 12 through 23 usually. Okay. Um, we're sitting, we have this nice little storm that's, that's come through the last couple of days. Uh, I think you told me before we started on the podcast uh, that you had five inches of snow on the ground. Um, how dry was it before this storm? It's been pretty dang dry. I mean, granted, we did have a great spring and winter this last year, but our monsoon was pretty pathetic. And, you know, it was dry and, and really crunchy. I mean, we did a late archery bow hunt up in Unit 27, and it was, I mean, it was like sneaking on cornflakes. It was it was dry and it was tough but this i mean before we got this five inches here it put down quite a bit of rain before this so we're pretty saturated now so it's a good start potentially for you know winter moisture this is a great start to have a have a november storm like this wouldn't you agree oh definitely and that and i know one of the guys was telling me earlier this morning that you know, he was up around Alpine, and they were having about eight to nine inches. So, it's it's going to be a good storm to help us out with a great start. It looks like next week. Um, I didn't check for your area, but next week, right around Thanksgiving, I want to say Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they're calling for another three days of rain. So, you know, this is one of those things that we always, you know, look at, and and you know, it's a good start, um, and we've shown that. You know, this year proved that winter moisture is king, and and um, so you know if we could just keep a great winter going, it'd be interesting to see back-to-back -back great winter moisture years. What would happen? You know, me being kind of the pig that I am, I I really wanted to see great winter moisture and then great monsoonal moisture, and just see what what would really happen. Um, I've got to think that by having really lackluster monsoons, that it, it, it's got to play some effect. I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, overall health of the animals and antler growth, or do you think that, you know, 
getting good winter moisture is is really all that we need. No, I mean I think I think you know some monsoon rains would would have definitely helped out a lot because you go to a lot of places right now where you know these animals had great feed you know throughout the growing period you know early early spring they had feed coming up and then you know by the time summer rolled around there wasn't much feed left and it's it's dry we didn't get the rains so they did get the good horn growth but. I mean, a lot of areas that we're going to now are are pretty sparse and lacking a lot of feed. Um, not so much in, say, units 1 or 27, but uh, a lot of these drier units, I mean, there's just no feed. Even the ranchers are feeding their cows on a daily basis, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as far as deer, and we're going to get to late elk, um, but as far as deer goes, uh, with, with the deer hunts, uh, you know, do you have scheduled deer hunts coming up both in Arizona and New Mexico? No, we, we're pretty much done in Arizona. We didn't get anybody in the late season this year, um, but we do have a deer hunt left over in New Mexico, so we're concentrating on that and just take take it as they come, you know. Sounds good. Um, I want to dive into late elk hunting um and first before we kind of get in there talk a little bit about the units that you hunt both in arizona and in new mexico for late elk hunts to kind of lay a groundwork of the experience level that you have hunting those bulls in the late season um talk a little bit about you know the country the terrain the topography uh of those units that you have experience in yeah, so Arizona and New Mexico, the late hunts, they they will vary in, in terrain by quite a bit. Um, a lot of the units that we will hunt in New Mexico will consist of the cedar and pinon and juniper, you know, with uh, sandstone and rim rock rims. But Arizona, you know, you, you'll be up in the high high timber, the big canyons in the, in the burn, and it, it can be a completely different scenario as far as terrain but basically you're going to hunt them the same way you're going to dig them up with the glass in the late season uh do you get any sort of migration i get this question a lot for like one in 27 if we get these snows and and such uh do you get any migration at all with these with these bulls you know, we we used to get it quite a bit, Jay, but after the fire hit in 2011, um, there's so much feed on top of the mountain that there are very few elk that will migrate with just a little bit of snow. It's really got to accumulate to a lot of snow to really drive them off. When you go into these late elk hunts, um, and, you know, you guys have a, a slew of hunters, um, what is your overall mindset or strategy as far as, you know, how are you going to pick the areas that you're going to hunt for these bulls? What are you looking for? We base that solely on pre-scouting. So, um, you know, some years we may hit one area really hard, and then the next year it may not be an area that we're going to concentrate on at all. So just mainly just hit it hard before the season and, and – base our decisions on our preseason scouting and and when you're scouting like are you looking for places you know knobs and rims and and bandages where you can see lots of country or are you taking the opposite approach and kind of going micro and and just looking at small canyons and and you know working it on foot how, how, what's your main strategy man we'll to be honest, Jay, we'll do a lot of both of that. Um, a lot of areas, you know, we'll set up high where you can just basically glass all day and just catch, you know, bulls moving around and stuff coming and going. And a lot of other areas that we'll look at, they will also be areas that, you know, you can look at for a little bit, but then you're going to have to move down the ridge and keep looking into pocket after pocket after pocket. And, you know, both types of areas have proven to be really good for us 
Is there any one particular thing that you would say for those listening that have late elk hunts that, you know, if you can if you can find this or if you can do this or, you know, some sort of, you know, something that's worked for you where, you, you know, you say typically the bulls are going to be here or there or this is what I'm looking for. Is there anything that stands out from your perspective? Big rough country and north facing slopes is is my main key right there. That's what I will key in on at first. Why the big rough country? Explain that to people. That's that's where we tend to find the bulls at this time of year. I mean, if if you're in the more mild country, generally you're going to be looking at cows and raghorns. But if you get into that rougher country, you're going to see a big jump in the age class of the bulls and the size of the bulls and generally the number of bulls. I mean, I'll go an entire late season and not see a cow. So but, if guys are out there scouting right now uh, and or if they're on their hunt and all they're seeing is cows and calves and, and, and small raghorn bulls, they're probably looking in the wrong area, right? Definitely, yeah. They need to move to some rougher country and in my opinion and when you say rougher country um are you looking for as rough as you can possibly find i mean bouldery rocky you know craggly steep you know what exactly is there one thing you're looking for or just as nasty as it gets no it doesn't have to be extremely nasty or anything but um you know generally you you could be looking at heard the cows and, and a mile away there could be a good pocket of bulls but generally those cows are going to be in the more mild country you know the flatter timber with some meadows here and there but the bulls are going to be up on the big faces and canyon country and that that's what i tend to look for do you normally when you find a pocket do you find a pocket of you know four five six eight bulls or is, are some of the big mature bulls just solo bulls? You'll, you'll find a lot of both. I mean, a lot of areas that we'll look at are places where, you know, you might see a solo bull one ridge over and a couple ridges up canyon or down canyon. From there, you might see a group of four or five. But generally, to me, it seems like you know, the older bulls are around the other bulls, but they kind of like to drift off to the side a little bit. And then you talk about north-facing slopes, and I've been trying to, you know, try and educate and inform people on my Instagram as well, talking about, you know, glassing into those north and northeast-facing slopes. Explain to the people that are listening from your perspective why north facing slopes are what you look for you know the, the elk just seem to get pulled to those slopes like like a magnet it's just something we always find them on it and i don't know you know you think in the summertime you know it's a lot cooler and everything but you will see them laying in the north slope in a foot of snow and you know, sometimes it doesn't make much sense because you think they got to be freezing, but that's where you'll find them most of the time. Yeah, I get a lot of questions. I mean, a couple a week where people are saying, well, with colder temperatures, they're going to be more on the south-facing slopes, aren't they? And I always respond, elk don't feel cold like you and I feel cold. And, and until, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in Colorado and, you know, some pretty harsh conditions where, I'll see those elk, they'll be feeding kind of up at, you know, maybe out on a little open patch and then it's, you know, colder than it can be. It's, it's, it's cold and wind blowing and snowing sideways and they'll just creep right over to a north facing slope and go bed down, just like you said, lay down right in the snow and they're happy as a clam. So people need to understand that, you know, what we feel as humans as, you know, cold temperatures, elk, you know, God made them in a way that they, they don't feel cold like you and I feel cold. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. You know, they don't they don't feel it like we do for sure. I mean, I, I will find, you know, where if a north-facing slope is getting blasted in the wind, then I will find them move out of that north-facing slope. But that that's about the only thing I've seen that'll 
kind of drive them out of a north facing slope as if they're getting the wind out of the north and they're just getting blasted. Up until this storm that we're having right now, um, would you say that your late elk scouting would be focused in areas where there's where there's lots of water? Um, and and now that we've gotten you know you're getting five inches of snow on the ground, would you say that that's pretty much gone now and and you don't have to they won't be as keyed in on water? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this, on this late archery hunt we just got off of, the bulls were were all pretty much right near some some water source you know rather it be in a creek or a stream or their tanks whatever they were they were around it pretty close but i this they could drift off now and i mean now i mean they can drift miles and so it, it opens up the country as far as it, it, it's going to spread them out don't you agree yes definitely okay um as far as equipment and gear is there anything that really changes between you know the rut season and the late season as far as your glassing your equipment you know that you're using or are you using all the same stuff and if so kind of what are you using no i i use all the same equipment throughout the year you know i'll i'll run a set of 10s 15s and and a btx and that's that's generally with me on the bow hunts all the way through the end of the year and the only thing that will really change from season to season is my boots and my clothing talk a little bit about how your clothing changes you know i always tell guys when they come out you know don't don't overdress oh whether it's in the bow season the late season you know a guy wants to dress in layers um Definitely in the later season, you're going to want to be in some warmer layers. But, you know, if you leave the truck in a huge parka and everything and you got a two-mile hike, you're going to be drenched when you get there. So I, I tell guys all the time, you know, dress in lay layers where you, when you're hiking, you can shed a bunch of clothes, and as soon as you stop, you can throw them back on. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And then as far as boots, are you just wearing uh, boots with a lot more insulation in them? Yeah, on these later hunts, not, not a ton more insulation, but I, I will run a lightly insulated boot, uh, maybe a heavier sock, but also a, about a two-inch taller boot as well. And then gaiters? Depending on the snow, gaiters will either... One of those things I might wear them one day, might not the next, but generally in the snow, yeah, I'm going to throw my gaiters on. Okay, and then have you found anything when you're up glassing um, to do to keep in your feet warm? I mean, do you get, you're up on big knobs. Do you ever start fires if you get cold and, and warm up, or what do you do? Man, I, I hate to do it, but sometimes we will. Um, generally, I don't like to start a fire anywhere near where I'm glassing but sometimes it's just so brutal cold it's either you got to warm up or you're not going to be able to sit it out the whole day you know so that's something we will do other than that you just got to get up and move it around a little bit and keep some of that blood flowing as far as pressure that the elk feel late season um, do you feel that they're more susceptible to being very keen and aware of what's going on compared to the early season when they're rutting and bugling talk a little bit about that how, how they change their behavior yeah their behavior will definitely change i mean like i mentioned earlier we just got off that late archery hunt and it was a grind i mean trying to sneak up on them this time of year with a bow is a lot harder than you know in the rut when their mind is drifting elsewhere but um, with the rifle, you know, it, it doesn't really seem to change much because you're, you know, generally shooting them across a canyon or, you know, shooting them 400 yards away. So they don't seem to be super aware of any of that, obviously. But um, if you're trying to get in close, they're dang sure a lot harder to get up on this time of year than they are, say, during the rut. Is there a certain distance, you know, on these late elk hunts, 
is there a certain like buffer zone that you prefer to you know stay and don't don't get any closer than a certain distance? Do you, is there a rule that you kind of live by, or do you just is each situation different? You know, each situation is different depending on the terrain, but generally, I mean, if I don't have to break about 300 yards on an animal, I won't. I mean, a 300-yard shot is extremely doable. I mean, anybody who's coming out elk hunting should be prepared for that that shot. I mean, nowadays with the technology, it's it's a chip shot. And if you don't have to break it, why why risk it, you know? Dar and I have said for a long, long time with coos deer specifically, if, if you know, we never like to get inside of 300 yards of a deer that we want to kill, and we found that that 300 yard mark is a pretty good barrier where any of the little sounds that you guys make when you're trying, you know, trying to set up and get ready for the shot, you know, maybe a tripod leg clanking against the rock. I mean, you know, that three to 400 yards is is a good rule of thumb I think and totally agree with you that you know that kind of gives you a little bit of space to communicate with the shooter and you know whisper and and do all of that but you know you can kind of get away with quite a bit at you know 300 plus yards it's it's just always amazing to me how when you get inside of that 300 yards you know get in there you know 175 200 yards how it's amazing how they those animals can hear they can pick you off, and, um, you know, I think that's a good tip for people out there. If, if you're confident with your shooting, you know, give them a little buffer, and, and don't. there's no need to get any closer than 300 yards with rifles these days. Um, you know, you, you should be able to make that shot uh, every day. Um, so that's, that's just a tip out there. So what do you, what's your outlook for, the late elk hunts in Arizona this year as far as size and quality? Are you seeing tons of broken bulls, or what's your thoughts? No, really. I mean, you know, we just got off of a, about 10 days up there, and it, it, uh, we saw a handful of bulls that were, you know, busted here and there, but, I mean, for the most part, I'd say 90% of them are completely intact. So, it's, so you it's feel like it's, it's, it, yeah. Do you think one or twenty-seven? Do you think will which one do you think this year will produce bigger bulls in the late hunt? Twenty-seven. I mean, you know, uh, histor- historically we've talked how those bulls, a lot of those one bulls, go to twenty-seven. Is, is that is that what you're seeing this year as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for for years and years, I mean, you'll get a lot of the. 27 bulls that will end up in unit one to rut um and then they will come back from unit one back to 27 for this time of year and i mean it just historically has been that way for as far back as i can remember well that's uh that's exciting so you guys have do you have hunters in one and 27 both yes we do okay and those kick off, I think, the day after Thanksgiving. Um, what kind of conditions would you say would be optimal for, you know, obviously you, no one can control the weather, but if you just said this is what would be perfect, what would it be? Would it be tons of snow and weather, you know, lots of weather, or would it be bluebird and cold, or what, what would be perfect? You know, I, I like a little bit of weather, but generally that time of year when with the weather comes the fog and a lot of times you'll get fogged in for a day or two and you know obviously that's going to put a big damper on the glassing and pretty much you're at a standstill till it breaks but a little bit of weather throughout the hunt is always a a good thing yeah talking about fog i mean it, it's something that all you know hunters have to deal with but when you get a big fog bank i mean there's virtually nothing you can do um do you do you change your tactics or do you just all of a sudden say you know we've just got to accept what we've got and wait till it breaks and be ready when it breaks or do you actually get out on foot and try and kick stuff up it just doesn't seem very effective to me no that's (laughs) that 
very, very rarely will kicking them up work like that. Um, a lot of times that's when we'll try to concentrate on those smaller pockets where maybe you might get a little bit of vis visibility at short range. You know, we might check a few of those smaller pockets. And other than that, you know, you just got to basically wait it out. You want to be where you need to be when it breaks. So we'll pay close attention to the weather radar and see about what time it's going to lift. Gotcha. Right on. Um, do you have any tips for elk hunters, late elk hunters, um, you know, with this season coming up that are listening? Do you have any tips that you can think of that would help them? Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times we get guys that come out, and depending on the terrain that we're in, on any given scenario, it's, it's amazing how many guys don't know how to get set up behind their rifle, you know. So guys need to know how to get set up. Um, you know, they need to get up set up solid and need to get up set, get set up fairly fast. You know, whether they're laid out prone, they're sitting, they're standing. I mean, you never know if you're going to be on flat ground, a side slope. You know, you just got to be prepared to get set up in any type of situation. And I think that's a great tip. One of the things I might add to that is um, even when you're out in the field and let's say you're out there and, you know, you've been glassing and, you know, it doesn't hurt to say, okay, across the canyon there's a big, you know, a big white boulder and just literally go through the fire drill of that's a bull and I need to shoot that bull. And, you know, the person you're with is probably going to think you're crazy, but just say I'm going to set up and act like that rock is a bull that I need to shoot. And, I mean, get your pack, get it, you know, if you have to, you know, prop the pack up with some rocks underneath it, I mean, go through the drill of actually setting up and trying to shoot that white boulder as if it's a, a bull. And you'd be surprised if you do that every day, you know, the hunts are, you know, usually a week long. If you do that for two or three, four days, you know, do it in a morning setup, do it in the evening when you're glassing and just go through that exercise that when the actual time comes and you've got to shoot a bull and you've just been rehearsing it, it's amazing how much more comfortable and how much more calm you become because you've done it before. Um, and I think, I think even experienced guys can, you know, practice that a little bit and just kind of get in the routine of how your pack lays out, um, you know, how your gun lays on your pack, you know, how your body reacts to laying down and, you know, getting in shooting position. All things that we, you know, you think are elementary, but really, it, you know, if you can be real comfortable and good at that, Justin, I think that's a great tip that you bring. Yeah, def definitely setting up and practicing like that, Jay. That's something I will do personally on my own hunts all the time. You know, if you see a animal that you're going to pass on, whatever, you know, a lot of times I'll get it, get set up, put them in the scope, and just see, see what it looks like. You know, get on it, maybe dry fire on it a couple times. It's It's great practice. Yeah, good. Any other tips you got? You know, only take shots that you're confident in, you know. Guys all the time will just send them down range, you know. And if you're not confident in the shot, odds are you shouldn't be taking it. So yeah. guys need to take shots that they're fully confident in. Yeah, and something I might add to that as well is, um, you know, have your guide, have your spotter, have your friend next to you and calling the shots. And your job as a shooter is to, you know, make your shot, but, you know, load your weapon again and be ready for the follow-up shot. You know, acquire the target, get right back on the animal, look through the scope, um, and, and try not to get excited and everybody jumping up and down saying you got them. You need to focus on your job of making sure the animal's down. So I, I typically will like to get right up next to my client with my binos on a tripod and talk them through it. And I tell them, okay, now when you make this shot, I want you to get back in the scope, acquire the target, whether he's down or standing or what he's doing, until I tell you, 
okay, he's 100% dead. That way, I've seen so many times where a guy makes a shot and everybody's hooping and hollering and, you know, the elk isn't hit good or the deer isn't hit good and, you know, they're out of, they're not in the gun and they could have prevented an elk or deer getting away or, you know, at least getting another good shot in them. So that's something I'm always really, really um, kind of anal about and, and really focus on trying to get the hunter to focus on, you know, you may have to make three or four great shots. I mean, how many times, Justin, have you seen an elk just hit perfect and they just stand there? And a lot. You, I mean, you need to you need to just keep shooting at that bull and and getting as many bullets into that bull as you can as quickly as and, and effectively as possible. Yeah. Um, sometimes one bullet doesn't do it. You know, sometimes I've seen elk I, literally where you they're just standing there and they get shot four or five times and they're still standing there stiff legged. And you know, your job as a hunter and a shooter is just to keep filling them up. Yep, and, and you know, you mentioned follow-up shots, Jay. One thing I, I like to tell guys a lot is, you know, when before you make that shot, you need to pick up some good reference points as to where he's at, you know, with with your, for yourself and for whoever else is with you because, you know, if you're looking at a big hillside and, and you hit him or miss him and, you know, you need to say, you know, if he runs 100 yards over to the right, you need to have a reference point that direction, you know, above him, below him, whatever, to where you can say, okay, hey, find the, the big boulder with the snow patch on top or, you know, something like that, and then, you know, guide him in from there. But if you have something like that, you're going to be able to get a follow-up shot a lot quicker than if you don't. Yeah, I think that's super good advice. Um, and playing off of that as well, I think – it makes me think of after you shoot an animal and it's down, it's always good to take a picture with your phone of that hillside with your finger pointing at some reference over there um, because it always seems when you get over to try and, you know, get your animal that the hill looks completely different. And what I also like to do is I always like to leave a spotter or someone back at the shooting position at, until you get over to the animal because I've seen it so many times where guys, you know, and even I've gotten over there and I can't find, it just looks different and it doesn't make sense. And if you leave a spotter um, who can either direct you with hand signals or radio or even yelling at you, um, it makes a huge difference, especially if you shoot something, you know, right before dark and the last thing you want to do is leave that thing overnight, uh, you know, and the coyotes get it or whatever. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with, with um, you know, before you shoot, what we like to do exactly is, is establish a couple of common points. You know, a big dead snaggly tree on the left and a big rock bluff on the right, and the elk is between that. And if something goes awry, we're going to use the left tree that's a snaggly tree that's dead, and we're going to use on the right, we're going to use the big bluff. And are you, yep. are you on that? Yes. Okay, so if I tell you it's going, uh, you know, to the left towards the snaggly tree, you'll know exactly where it's at. And it just makes it so much more efficient um, when it kind of stuff starts getting, you know, heated and sideways. It's, it's nice to kind of have some common points. Any other tips that you can think of, Justin? No, I mean, not, not really. I mean, just dress warm and, and dress in layers, you know. It's, it's, yeah. These late hunts can be brutal cold. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, great talking to you. Um, it's always great watching your success on your Instagram, um, Premium Hunts Instagram page. And um, you guys do a really good job. I uh, appreciate you coming on and sharing with us and wish you the best of success coming up on the future late elk hunts. Uh, and uh, can't wait to see some of the bulls you guys knock down. And want to give you a chance to let people know how they can reach out to you, Justin. Yeah, they can find us either on the web at uh, premiumhunts.com or they can look us up on Instagram, Facebook, or Facebook. Uh, we're on both of those. Um, you know, all our contact information you can find on on our web page. And it, anyway, anybody wants to get a hold of us, those three avenues are probably the best. Awesome, man. Great. Sounds good. Well, 
Thanks for sharing with us. God bless, and we'll be chatting at you down the road here. Hey, thanks for having me on, Jay.